Good morning, everyone. My name is Abigail, and on behalf of the organizers, Oliver Kinross, I'd like to welcome you all to the Festival of Digital Construction Online USA. I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our sponsors, but with very special mention of Unify Labs, our sponsor of today's webinar. Today's session will be looking at coordinated, accurate, efficient, and organized, optimizing collaboration using BIM. And the session will be moderated by Karen Pierce and joined by our fantastic lineup of panelists. There'll be plenty of time for Q&A throughout the session, so do please take the opportunity to submit any questions you have in the questions box on your screen. I hope you all enjoy today's discussion, and I'd like to hand over to you now, Karen. Perfect. Thanks so much, everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started here just by going about and showing my screen. So I think I actually might have the wrong screen showing, so I do forgive me here. Seems the best, most practice you have, um, things always just go a little wonky once you go live. So anyways, thank you again all for joining us today. Our topic is really gonna be talking about optimizing collaboration using BIM, really staying coordinated, accurate, efficient, and of course, organized. So our agenda today, I am gonna give you a little bit of introduction on who Unify is, and we're gonna be then jumping right into our panel discussion. We have Francois joining us from Arcadis, Shahil from SOM, Sean from Thornton Tomasetti, Shannon from McCarthy, and Damien from De, De Simone Consulting Engineers. And we will be having Q&A, of course, throughout today's conversation. So it does look like I'm actually still sharing the wrong screen, so. Apologies here. Hi, Karen. It looks like it's coming through okay from our side. Okay, so you just you you see the PowerPoint in its in its glory. Okay, fantastic. Absolutely. All right, perfect. Um, all right, so I'm then going to go ahead and just we'll conclude today with our Q and A. All right, a little bit of introduction about me. Um, I have got about 10 years of experience so far in the AEC industry, and I've really been leading the char charge on expanding BIM technology. I got my start actually on the contractor side, working with a design build contractor as an electrical designer. I've worked on quite a few prestigious projects at the time, such as the Georgia Proton Therapy Center, Northside Cherokee Hospital, and quite a few data centers. Um, I'm always though looking to expand my knowledge with those I work with, so because of that, I became a BIM manager working through for an architecture firm. It's quite the culture shock as well as, of course, the way everyone works within Revit. But throughout the years, I've really managed to work with several organizations, no matter whether we're talking to architects and engineers or design build contractors, to really expand whether just basically BIM in general. Um, I've worked with BIM implementation plans. I've identified software where it's needed. I've created training plans that go with that. And of course, metric reports. Right now, I'm actually the senior BIM specialist at Unify Labs, which is really the industry's leading cloud-based BIM data, project insight, and content management platform. In my role here too, I work very closely with our enterprise customers to act as a consultant. I really listen and I provide solutions to a number of different challenges. So BIM content is everything. Why? Well, because content is a type of representation of data, and that really is allowing you to use the data in your projects. It can help you not only with, of course, modeling the size within the Revit environment, but we can really get pretty detailed with it, with, with forecasting, calculating, ordering, and of course, actually project definition. So we're going to actually go right into a poll right now, and I'm curious, where do you host your BIM content? All right, so um, if somebody could assist me here, I'm actually not seeing our poll results at the moment. There's some, maybe something uh, weird on my end here. Hi, Karen. Um, I can certainly read them out for you if you like. Um, so the answer to where do you host your BIM content library, uh, we had 10% Unify, 55% Boulder System, 
uh, zero for veil and 35 for other. All right, fantastic. So on those other um, items, since there's such a large number of you, if you could go ahead and utilize the chat functionality, I'm curious what other systems you might be utilizing. Good to see we have a healthy number, of course, of Unify customers. And by all means, it is not surprising to hear how 55% of you are still on the file folder system. Heck, it's a free system and why mess with something that isn't broken, right? So let's get into a little bit about what Unify can actually do for you guys. So why Unify really? Now, I'm a numbers person. I always have been. Maybe it's because I got my start on the electrical side. So this slide really where I'm going to be talking about is really talking about a billable rate. So what money do I have actually potential to bill my client with? And I've kind of taken that number at about $120 an hour. And let's say you're about 80% billable. So do you know the true cost of content or better yet, what is content? So 3D content can of course be built either from manufacturers or developed in house to help you work with real life items equipped with parameters. No big surprise there. But content can also be actually what's used to create bill of materials, maybe prefab sets, ordering lists, maybe even reliable calculations for your MEP systems. And it's important to focus on quality data, no matter your place in the digital construction world, as it's on you to make sure the overview of content provided is absolutely relevant. Therefore, good, up-to-date content is required. But what defines really good content? We're talking maybe compact content, such as maybe small in size, right and correct data, easy to use and maintain, and easy to find. And even when you have all of those items in place, well, that billable rate to place your good piece of content is $4. Very nice, right? But what about bad content or content you might run the risk of not being updated? This can be content that's hard to find. And I've seen some very well-defined file folder systems, but I still have to know exactly where my content is located. And search in the file folder system really will only capture that file name. What about looking at the metadata of the content? Better yet, maybe that content can be near impossible place, maybe because it's just not modeled correct, but maybe it's the best I have. Maybe it doesn't quite document schedule or better yet, even coordinate correctly. So essentially it's a hidden time bomb. And even if we're thinking that maybe it takes us maybe 15 minutes to find this piece of content, what if this content runs the risk of crashing our Revit project? And let's say our dime time's only an hour and the project is small, so we've only got five users. But when you do the math, and again, that billable rate, we've gone from $4 to $630 very quickly and very easily. So there is definitely a cost to having both good and bad content. Now, for a file folder system, what happens when we actually talk about perhaps the risks of ignoring this BIM content? So when you get into the risks, oops, I'm so sorry, guys. Got a little over eager there in my notes. The risks of ignoring content. So content management. Well, you do have, of course, the findability problems. So maybe users just don't know necessarily the name of what they're looking for. Perhaps, you know, if you're on the architecture side, perhaps your users are looking for millwork but maybe it's actually casework in the name, or perhaps we're looking for cabinet. Either way, you end up having some restrictability and just the ability to find content. And of course, there's versioning issues. Whether we're talking about content that needs to be updated to the latest and greatest version, maybe we're talking about, you know, just automatically upgrading to the next re Revit release. I've definitely seen file folder systems that have dedicated folders for every Revit version. But then what happens when you need to update content? Does that content actually really ensure that you're getting to the latest and greatest? So what we're going to go ahead and do then as well is, of course, let's talk about maybe uncoordinated processes and lack of visibility. Who ultimately is responsible for updating your content? How do you ensure that content gets updated? In the end, really what we're looking at is lots of wasted time. And the risks of ignoring content, I mean, we all have life. We all know, though, that really the only two problems that go away with just ignoring them is, you know, snow and adolescence. And thank goodness we're in April. Snow seems to be a thing of the past. And well, if you've got adolescent teenagers, my hat's off to you. So once again, why unify? Here's another ROI example. I'm all about that ROI. This data shown, though, is from a survey we took asking current customers what search and load time was like before Unify and now. So I showed you the billable cost of content a few minutes ago. So let's talk direct salary dollars this time around. With Unify, our search and load times can be as short as 30 seconds. 
compared to traditional methods of let's say 10 minutes this time. If I'm searching for content maybe just two or three times daily, that really equates to 650 searches per user per year. And something I hear often is that, well, we're too small to need a content management solution. I'd like to argue that's not true. Unify has a place for firms small and large. So let's say your firm has just 25 designers. With looking for content just two or three times a day, the potential work hours saved annually is more than 2,400 hours. And this cost savings equates to about $3,700 per user or rather 92,000 across even a small firm. So that's salary dollars diverted back to your design time, letting you get more done with less. Now, once again, why Unify? So there's a lot of content management systems out there and there's a great ROI for all of them. So again, why specifically us? Couldn't you go with a cheaper solution? Of course. But with Unify, we have features that support the digital construction space like no one else. As we are 100% cloud-based, content can be worked on anywhere, anytime. We're connecting teams, which enhances collaboration and results in higher quality projects. It makes it easier to maintain compliance standards and keep your data in check. And other benefits, of course, we've got versioning, automatic upgrading, and backups. So some of the CMS platforms too we've discussed can sometimes offer cloud functionality, but not all cloud can be created equal. With Unify's cloud-based system, not only could you manage your loadable families and PDFs, but we can talk about system families, drafting views, legends, materials, fill patterns, schedules, bills of material, model groups, prefab items, and more. So definitely something to be taken a look at no matter where your stance at with the digital construction space. So one of the top five features we have is really just search. The search interface is really gonna be easy to use and terminology for every word within the search bar. So if we take a closer look at this, do you need a scissor lift instead of seeing all lifts? Well, no problem. Simply add scissor to the search bar and we'll remove the others. Additionally, with the ability to search the metadata of the content, we're able to find content by type name, parameter names, tags, Revit categories, and more. So search has more power than ever before. And maybe you're not sure what you're looking for. So we offer browse abilities and the power to save searches for content that is referenced commonly in any number of ways. And here's an example, maybe diving deeper into something I call save searches. So with save searches, we can actually take the mystery out of search or browse. And if I'm working across the pond, I can even separate out imperial content from metric or even put up my vendor content such as this from Cooper Lighting. Essentially, there's no complicated search criteria for my end user to remember just three clicks, and it's easy, easy as the arrows you just showed. So we have flexibilities for searches that can be accessed by all users of your company with the company save searches, or users can simply create their own. Now, no matter how you're searching for content, we all know content evolves over time. So how is the content update process today? We found with all firms that answer is everything from an email to a chat to a quote, it never got to the content manager from the project lead. So with a built-in content request workflow, no matter whether you're working with Revit or not, you can connect all of your internal teams to your digital content. And our content request workflow even includes a built-in discussion board for those bound to happen to have questions. And then once the content is uploaded, we of course handle the revision history of the content, and automatically upgrade your Revit base file for easy reference, no matter the version year your designers are working with. So no more need for that multiple folder structure for multiple years of Revit. Now, I left off a bit giving you the highlights of the Unify platform. Unify allows you to review parameter data of your Revit content. So what that means is we can provide better management of the shared parameter file itself. All users would be able to review the parameter file within the web portal. And yes, view means search too. I've often come across users adding a new shared parameter to the file simply because they didn't realize it was already created. But I've done it as a bit manager. And with Unify, we even make it easy to find parameters that already exist. Or even better, users have the power to edit 
the shared parameters directly within the web portal. So there's really no need to delete old parameters not in use. Actually, there is definitely a need for that, but there's no problem with that. We actually can even rename parameters, switch groups with a simple dropdown, and or control visibility of parameters or edibility of those parameters. And managing shared parameters wouldn't be complete if we didn't have the ability to manage the revision history, like you see here. I can see who modified it and when, and also restore previous versions if admins get a little bit over eager. Now, if content is king, then project analytics is its queen. While content is the building block, ultimately we produce a model, even when we're design build contractors. So keeping an eye on model health, whether we're talking about rabbit warnings, or better yet, the content within the model, using Unify, we're able to see that the content comes from a vetted source. And better yet, what we can do is actually identify the revision history. So this way I can ensure that my projects have the latest and greatest of my content that meets the latest standards. All right, all. And with that, I would like to go ahead and introduce today's panel. So Francois, let's go ahead and start with you. All right, thank you very much, Karen. Let me see if I can put my camera on. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Francois Perret. I'm the original BIM manager for Arcadis North America. So um, my background is civil engineering. I got a civil engineering background uh, from um, France. As you can tell, I've started as a bridge designer and a bridge uh, project manager for Arcadis in France and quite quickly, uh, dove into the beam side of the business with a big interest into this new type of delivery process. So I was lucky enough to lead the beam implementation for Arcadis France for some years, working very closely with my colleagues in Europe um, before moving to the US three years ago. So now as a, as a regional beam manager, my role is to advise the business line leaders on the best way to implement beam in our delivery processes. Um, so I'm you know, advising them on training programs, on new processes, templates. So I'm not anymore involved in the, in the daily projects and in the technology, I will say that's a bit more high level around beam implementation strategy. And I do also uh, advise some external clients on their own beam transformation and beam strategy. Yeah, so the, that's me. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Damien, please. I'm Damien DeSantis from DeSimone Consulting Engineers. I'm the BIM manager here, not only dealing with our structural practice, but our other practices as well. Um, I've been in CAD and then BIM for the past 14 years. Um, and now similar to Francois, you know, not heavily into the production uh, anymore, you know, providing training, you know, for our, our engineers, as well as our BIM staff, um, but also trying to develop new technologies, new applications, um, you know, across, uh, across the company. Pleased to have you, Damien. Shahil? Yes, hey everyone, this is Sahil. Um, I'm the design technology manager focusing on BIM at SOM in the New York office. Um, my background is in architecture. I have an architectural degree, um, but I've, always been interested more in technology side of architecture than the design aspect. And um, so I've been in the industry for 10 years and now, you know, I am a part of the design technology committee, uh, which is our firm wide committee for um, advising on best practices, research and uh, training to all of our users across all of our, um, the SOM offices. And I've been working on all different kinds of projects from super tall towers to airports to small um, universities to you know full spectrum of building but um, yeah we um, we typically would be involved mostly in like I wouldn't be involved in production work anymore but more like just an overseeing and research-based role yeah thank you for having me 
Hey, you're the right hand of those production people, so you. So I definitely understand the value. Sean, please. Hello, uh, Sean McDonald. I am the Midwest Regional Bid Manager for Thornton Tomasetti. Uh, been uh, worked in a number of, of uh, different trades, uh, from KPF to Paycob Freed, WeWork, Case, Shen Milson, Wilkie, and now Thornton Tomasetti. Uh, so, so touched it from a lot of different sides. Uh, primarily, right now, I'm focused on um, workflow and process, trying to streamline and improve, and also the never-ending task of revamping standards. Mm -hmm. Never ending is right. Um, I think you don't really realize how involved it can be until you're in the trenches. And then it's one question after another, for sure. Shannon, please. Aaron, uh, my name is Shannon Lightfoot. I'm the virtual design and construction manager uh, at McCarthy Building Companies. Um, so my main role uh, within the company is to advise all of our different groups on how to implement uh, and utilize value-added technology. Uh, so utilizing 3D models and uh, building information modeling to uh, best serve our client uh, and our folks on the, the project site. Um, I get to work with a, a lot of different groups. Uh, so I get to see projects where we're, uh, we're chasing projects as well as projects that are getting put in place. So um, my background is in architectural engineering, but I knew all along that construction uh, and general contracting was uh, going to be the way uh, that I would go for my career. Uh, definitely more interested in, in seeing buildings uh, get put together. And I play a big part in that and utilizing the technology to help us build those uh, buildings a lot better. Uh, so thank you for having me, Karen. It's certainly all our pleasure. So I'm stopping my screen sharing right now just so you can really see all of our faces. Hopefully the webcam is is working for everybody and you can see all of us. Um, so all it is a pleasure to certainly be here. And what we're really looking for today is just to kind of share some of our stories and lessons learned over the last year, especially when it comes to working in the design build space. One of the questions I did forget to ask earlier, especially if you're thinking about using a content management platform, maybe getting away from your hidden file folder, is that I'd like to introduce another poll. And I think that can lead well into our future discussions. And that poll really is how developed are your BIM standards? Hi, Karen. The results of the poll um, should now be showing. So um, we have what BIM standards was 20%. Some we transfer content from past projects, 31%. Decent, have a working template and library that needs work, 44%. And it's nearly perfect, 6%. <laughs> nearly perfect, 6%, guys. We want to know what your secrets are. Um, I do understand the nearly perfect, though. I mean, for example, Francois, um, I know Arcadis has some very, very particular standards, and I know that's been an, a big deal of work. So would you say your content is 6%? Perfect. No, I would not say it. I would not be. I, I would not be in that six person to be honest with you. Um, I think that on a high level perspective, yes, we have some standards when it comes to selecting the right technology to deliver a project, like software selection, common data environment selection, library management selection. We are aligned, and I would say, you know, Arcadis, we are a global company, twenty-seven thousand people around the globe. So that's a big company and we have managed to get that level of alignment on a high level from a technology side. Then when it comes to templates, when it comes to libraries, when it comes to the language differences and the culture, that's kind of, a, that's a huge challenge. And as Sean said, that's a continuous effort. And I think that it's important now 
to take one step back and to think about the return on investment in you know investing so much time and money into developing templates that will be out to date or outdated in one year because of new software because of new technology so i think we live in a very rapidly changing world and we need to be agile and i think that sometimes i try to remind myself and the teams that maybe we should not spend two months on that specific template to have something perfect because the perfect template will never exist and we should rather be agile do the 80 percent needed and leave the 20 percent for you know that's not needed to, to go there because the value is not there so that will be my, my view so i'm not i'm not on that nearly perfect template so. <laughs> Well, enough. you bring up a good point, though. You said that you find the time is maybe now more important than ever. So let's all talk about maybe the uncertainty around BIM as a result of the pandemic. You know, changing the wheels on your car was difficult enough when you were going 80 miles per hour. But I think the pandemic has just increased our velocity. So how have your workflows maybe changed from 2019 as we're making our way through 2021? And this question is open to anybody in our panel today. Well. I think that, that that there's been a, a change towards working from home over the past 10 years anyway. Uh, you think of 10 years ago when we were in this industry, no one worked from home. Uh, five years ago, some people. Three years ago, most people occasionally worked from home. Uh, this has just forced an acceleration of that. So I think it, for a lot of cases, the baseline for how we accomplish what we're doing from a remote location has been there. Just now we needed to push it to a degree where it can accommodate everyone and not just some people at a time. So I, I think it's been a trend, and I think it'll be, continue to be a trend to, to, to move us away from all being in the same spot at the same time. Um, and so I think, you know, I, 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 I think we had the, the baseline already, and we just we were pushed a little faster than we normally would be, which is probably a good thing. Yeah, I agree with Sean. I mean, we got thrown in it. I mean, one day we were in the office, the next week on the Monday we were we were out and had to work from home. Um, you know, credit goes to you know, our IT and our staff, you know, alone for making that adjustment so quickly. Um, it forced my hand to do a lot of things that were on my back burner that I needed to insert. For instance, like now our entire schedule and, you know, not plugging, but is on, you know, is on Microsoft Planner um, where everybody has access to it. So now instead of me going around or looking next to, you know, one of my teammates and asking what they're working on, I see it there and it's it's already set and everybody can see it, their teams can see it, um, project specific, you know, the project managers and associates can see it. So that alone, you know, really brought us even closer together working from home as opposed to being, you know, right in the office. That's a huge factor for us. Yeah, d definitely. I, I can, uh, you know, attest to that. I mean, you know, we, McCarthy, we're a, a national company, so we work with um, different teams all over the, the country, uh, even even within the region that, that I am. It's made up of Dallas, Houston, and Atlanta, so we have to work virtually uh, pretty much every day. Uh, we get on Zooms and calls just like this to, to talk about project strategy all the time, but uh, to, to your question, Karen, uh, I think it, it did you know, force us to work this way. Uh, even though the tools, like Sean said, they've been here for a long time, uh, I think this made us utilize the tools that we know we have at our disposal. Uh, and it, it kind of made the tools better too, just because um, we know everyone is using them now. So there's more features, there's better bandwidth, there's better connectivity. Uh, so all of that, I think the pandemic kind of helped us realize that these virtual tools are beneficial and valuable, and we can use them on a regular basis moving forward. Yep. And virtual tools brings up a great point. I'm actually specifically maybe curious, and I think a lot of people on the call would be as well, that there's really been a lot of cloud security hurdles, um, at least as far as from what I've seen on Unify side, and even when I was working as a BIM manager, that now seem to be, I guess you could say better accepted, could be a term. Has anybody kind of experienced the same shift going on regarding cloud security and virtual tools? From an organizational standpoint, it seems to be much more accepted and, and uh, uh, allowed. I know that um, for more secure stuff, it you know it, the, the systems have been vetted and are approved for more uh, use. There are still the occasional cases when you're doing secure work where it just can't be in the cloud, but it does seem to be 
uh, a less of a of a um, of a hurdle to get to get approval to to use the systems now. Yeah, I I completely relate on that, and I think that we used to use the cloud-based common data environment, you know, provided by Autodesk, for example, or on Beam 360. And because of COVID, we just had to use it because that was the only way for us to really access and to share information across the hundreds of offices we have across the US. And then, yeah, everyone really wanted to it. And I agree with Sean, some clients will still not be willing to have the, their data in the cloud for sure in terms of security. But honestly, this is a discussion I used to have a lot three or four years ago and way less now. So I think the adoption is really better. The cloud yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I also agree with Francios that, um, you know, we we were working um, collaborative before the pandemic as well, but because of the pandemic itself, like <clears throat> we've been forced to move to our um, cloud-based platforms. And it's actually been a very nice uh, transition. Um, another, uh, another thing that we actually realized is that before uh, we weren't having um, a level of, uh, like we were having very less collaboration between our different offices in terms of project work. Now it's one big office after the pandemic. Like once people have started working from home and once we've moved to even our technology side in not just in terms of Autodesk BIM platforms, but other platforms, we've also moved um, to the cloud for the most part. Uh, and then we now operate as you know one office versus individual offices. So it's it's much tighter collaboration for us as well. And we've certainly seen that shift on the Unify side as well, you know, where we once did have quite a few clients and prospects really being hesitant about hosting all of their content on the cloud. You know, Unify does use AWS, so it's one of the most secure data centers around the world you can utilize. But we have seen, A, that adoption you guys are talking about on being a little bit more open to hosting content outside of your network servers but also really just having that seamless transition to enable those work from homes. You know, I think we've seen all that VPN isn't as, um, I guess you could say as reliable as we once hoped and probably thought it was before the pandemic. And I think a lot of people have just had some education as a result of that, that hey, cloud-based I think is the way to go, whether we're talking about maybe BIM 360 models or whether we're just talking about content in general, files. All right, so I do want to maybe take a pause before we just dive into the next um, to topic question we had here. And maybe that's just talking about the general question on how does BIM or digital con technology really enhance project controls? I think this could be an easy one for our panelists to answer. <laughs> Happy to jump in, but very quick. I think it's about providing data to most of the project members, team members, in a way, in, a, in an easier way. So now we are generating data and in theory, that data is available to the right person at the right time, if the process mm -hmm. is in place and if it's well managed. So that's really about that information management and who accesses and what and why. And, and then I think that the project quality is way better thanks to that. Yep. I mean, even for us, like we, we treat it as, you know, us virtually constructing a building and then you have drawings and anything that's exported out of our models as a byproduct of what we've actually constructed in virtual space. Um, and, you know, in just in terms of um, Autodesk Revit, which is what we use for most of our projects, um, you know, it's, it's very, very easy to make sure that, you know, things are coordinated. I mean, and just the amount of time saved and the ability of having you know different people from anywhere in the world working on a single model um, is is an amazing thing you know just overall. Yeah, I think you, you, you know you both said it. It's it's about access to the to the data. Um, you know we you know we realized that um, you know a while ago that the data that we were getting from our design partners and the and the Revit models. Uh, that we could leverage that data uh, in, in a number of ways, especially in our pre-construction efforts to better set ourselves up for a successful project. And, 
utilizing that data to do the quantity takeoffs and understand the budget and the skin uh, of the building and the different materials and how that was actually affecting the uh, the, the construction schedule as well as uh, the life cycle cost of the building. Uh, you know, we, we definitely found a lot of value in utilizing that data. And, um, you know, we've been, we've been doing that moving forward uh, through our workflow. So definitely being able to access that and give access to other groups that have normally not been able to utilize that in the past. You know, our, our being, you know, someone who has been uh, involved with building information modeling for years, I'm familiar with that data, but then giving that same data and teaching other groups who may not know that that is available, uh, letting them know what the value of that is, and then showing them the, the correct way to e extract that data and utilize it in the, in the way that they do uh, has been very valuable for us. Right, that question well, kind of goes yeah. back. Go ahead. I'm sorry, that question kind of goes back to the first question, because as we can feed more information and more data in these models, Obviously, our templates and our families are going to change as well when we incorporate all these parameters with it. So, that, like, like Francois said in the beginning, that template's never going to be perfect because, you know, for us, number one, our client is our own team, our own office. And then secondarily, it's the construction manager or the general contractor that are looking at these models. We're understanding what they're looking for, where we can just provide that information and streamline it all the way into you know all the way into construction and then you know possibly into facilities management so having that data early on you know provides just a more streamlined process you know throughout the entire project's uh, lifespan absolutely i couldn't have said that better myself and i i seem to hear a recurring theme there of it all being about the data management a big topic of conversation i always hear about all the time is really level of detail or lod let's call it that and a lot of people will kind of consider it as a level of detail which has been around with the aia since 2008 but i think a different way to think about it is really that level of development because that's ultimately the data and what your users are looking for i mean we've got a question from the audience here really wanting to focus on problem solving rather than coordination and while your 3d extents of your objects are certainly imperative i do want to maybe argue that data is really more important than anything because that's ultimately what's solving your problems we are living in the age of, of big data and that's what makes the money now uh and you know this, this is the data and so pull it out don't just use it as let's you know make the parameters smarter. Let's let's get that information out. Let's let's use big data analytics to, to analyze it and see what we're doing and ask better questions about what we're doing. So we can we can we can come up with better processes. And Sean, I think that might take us into our next topic discussion as well, because for those who maybe are just scratching the surface at big data, or maybe they're, you know, they're part of that, you know, percentage where we really covered, hey, how developed are your BIM standards? You know, when you're going about trying to revamp your current process, what tool sets would you all feel are essential to properly implement or maybe just start leveraging BIM? I think, I think it varies. Uh, <laughs> I think it really depends. We, you'll, you'll probably hear a different answer from each person because um, you have different perspectives on the on this uh, on this uh, discussion. So, you know, on, uh, from the general contractor side, there's a uh, all of our a lot of our tools are centered around collaboration. So, how we can leverage a uh, design model and how we can leverage a fabrication model and bring those two together to see where we may have conflict before we build it. Uh, so for a general contractor, using those collaboration tools are probably at the forefront of, 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 of our business at, at McCarthy. Uh, and just being able to leverage information uh, from our design partners and use that downstream as well to help us construct better. Uh, so visual, visualization tools, analysis tools, um, you know, like Navisworks, Revisto, Assemble, those types of tools are going to be uh, you know, a paramount for us as general contractors because we need to utilize all of that data and then make an informed decision before we actually go out and, and build that project. We want to be well informed so that we can we can mitigate as much risk as possible before we actually put a shovel in the ground. And and I think it really goes back to your role in the in the project in the project life cycle. I mean. You start at the planning stage, design construction, and then operation and deconstruction. We all play different roles, and that's all complementary. But depending on the, your role and what you want to achieve, 
then you will use different set of tools. And hopefully with the concept of BIM, you can move data from a tool to the other. And that's the job of the BIM manager or the digital engineering lead or whoever to help the, the project team to know how to move that data from a place to the other. Because as Sean said, the value is in the data today. So we want to keep that data flow alive moving from a platform to the other. But I see examples here and within Arcadis where we do CFD analysis. So you, you use really a you know, finite element uh, analyzing software and you can use a, a Revit model as a, as a basis for that. You do not have to remodel everything from scratch in your analysis software. And that's, that's one small piece of, of the BIM workflow. And so going back to the roles and what you have to do on, a, on the project, what's, what's your task? Yeah, I mean, I, I also agree. Um, so what we also typically do is we we want to think about the whole, um, you know, the whole big picture, and then where we would stand um, in terms of, you know, for example, for us as designers, you know, we would mainly focus on the earlier parts of the entire, you know, building process. So our tools would be slightly different in terms of like we would use a lot of. Um, uh, you know, even before getting into BIM and Revit, we would use a lot of, um, you know, Grasshopper, Rhino, and, you know, scripting in terms of building design, how we want to analyze things, and in terms of sustainability, you know, all of those things. And then we, but but what we do is we would want to keep, um, you know, we, we try to keep reworking as least uh, as possible and use the exact same data throughout the, the entire process, at least from um, from where we start to where we have to, you know, submit our models but we also make sure that you know we know that our models are going to be used by our contractors so we make sure that you know we, we get the contractors also involved in the process so we know exactly what kinds of things they're looking for so we can you know both the, the design team and the um, contracting team they can like sit together and then before we get into like the detailed um, modeling and all of that we know exactly what they're looking for and then we can optimize our workflow so that it suits them and helps them out as well because it's it's the same data that's being transferred from one phase to another so they don't have to you know rework everything and that's true data collaboration right there um i'm curious and i'm about your opinion specifically sahil as well as maybe francois and everyone else on the panel but do you think the iso 19650 is a beneficial bim strategy to improve and coordinate bim management I think so. I mean, I think in the in in the U.S. particularly, BIM, you know, BIM standards have been a slow process of getting standardized, whether it's by federal, state, um, or even city, you know, or even city. The you know, once that gets approved, then it's another adaptation. Um, you know, I personally have you know have read them, have a general understanding. It definitely help. You know, it definitely helps, and it definitely will you know make things clearer. Um, you know, going forward, it's just that adaptation and then, you know, it's one level, say it's federal, and then when you get to the state, state requires different standards. And then when it gets to the city, especially in New York with DOB, that's a, a totally other animal. So it's trying to hopefully streamline it where you can just build on top of it just to make it easier and then customizable. So where then, like Sahil said before, you're dealing with whole, one whole office now with the pandemic. Now it's, you know, now it's even closer together because of those standards that haven't been adopted yet. And I think the ISO standard provides a very good framework to start with. And then of course, it's, you know, that's not enough, but it provides a framework that everyone can refer to and it provides a common language. We all speak about BIM execution planning. We all speak about BIM manager and what's the role of a BIM manager. What do we expect from them? What is a common data environment? All those things have been drafted and not, not only drafted, but documented in the ISO standard. And that's, especially in the digital description, that's important we all speak the same language because you see so many confusion around the dimensions of BIM and the BIM levels and the LODs, you know, and all those things. At least that's somewhere you have a document that you can refer to. And that's that's a very important first step. Yeah, I, I would also agree with them. Um, it's, you know, we need to be on the exact same language because we've been like um, a lot of cases where, 
you know, these confusions create a big issues down the road. So at least it, it's a good starting point. Like it's a great place to start from, but you know, all, you know, different, uh, different agencies might have different interpretations of those, or they might have to, you know, we might have to adapt them to fit different types of projects or different, um, you know, geographic regions for that matter. But, um, but yes, it's a good starting point. And then we always adapt as needed for different projects. Sean and Shannon, I'm not sure we've heard from you yet on this. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't have a whole lot to add on the on the ISO. I think it's as they've said, it's a, it's a, it's a baseline. So it uh, provides everyone a, a common language to speak in, and if there needs to be modifications to that, at least you're modifying from the same starting point and not diverging drastically and and and, and having to redefine terms and things like that. So, are you guys yeah, using I, that at Thornton Tomasetti? Uh, we're using it on the, the project by project. I mean, it really depends on what the, the whole design team is using for the the project. So, total sense. Yeah, and, and we, you know, uh, just like mentioned earlier, you know, it's 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 a baseline, and I think that's that's a start uh, because we have so many different uh, clients we work with, you know, um, uh, across all different markets and. Every client has a different, you know, requirement, and uh, there's specific standards for those requirements. And we even have a, a standard within our company uh, for delivering uh, BIM on a, a specific project, but that changes from project to project. So uh, again, I, I think everybody mentioned that that it, it's a baseline to start with, and then we kind of grow from there and uh, customize it to the specific projects. Absolutely. I've been seeing Omniclass, for example, being referenced more and more often, especially when it comes to the BIM data. Um, Unify is able to actually capture that information. You know, I, I think I mentioned that we can search by parameter. So we have seen a lot of momentum capturing a lot of that information. And kind of speaking about, you know, trying to adjust to all these different data workflows and really create that common data environment. And it's kind of circling back on a previous question, too, about workflows that have changed. What are probably the most useful third-party tools that improve workflow at home offices? Like, what could you not go without is probably a good way to put it. VPN slash TeamViewer at this moment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, VPN, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, that, that keeps us definitely connected to the uh to the home office so i agree yeah i mean we, we um mo most like our, our offices are split between you know like virtual workstations in the uh, which are actually physical machines in our office and then just us having to use you know any random laptop just to log in uh, and we also have laptops i mean we're also experimenting moving entire workstations to the cloud as well so it's it's um it's it's an ongoing process, but yeah, this this has been uh, in one sense, it's a, actually a very good opportunity to like try out new things and see what works. And then we've been uh, forced to you know adapt as fast as in like let's say literally as a week in which we needed to like you know set everything up, get everyone on board. Um, so it, it's it's a good time in in the sense that you know we we can actually like try out a few things. I think the communication tools have been vital, so you know. But we're using GoTo now and, and Teams is what we, we use at Thornton Tomasetti, but we, we were using Ring and, you know, whatever you use to communicate has definitely been, uh, you know, we thoroughly scrutinized to make sure that we're getting the best communications together since we're not in front of each other. I think task management is becoming larger because you're no longer sitting next to the guy who's poking you on the shoulder telling you to do something. You're expected to remember what you need to do and get it all done. So uh, being able to manage that. But I don't think that any of it is like vendor specific, I think it's, you need to figure out what your workflow is and find the tools that match your workflow instead of bending your workflow to match what tools you happen to have. And I totally yeah. agree with, with yeah. Sean reminding us that the communication is key. So I would say yes. technology without people behind the computers is kind of useless, you know? So we, we have to remember that technology is a key part of those processes, but communication is really key. Um, so yeah, Teams and Skype and whatever the platform you use, you, we have to remember that, yeah, we work in a Beam environment, in a digital environment, but there is nothing better than having a call, sharing a screen, and again, going through a model together. I mean, that's, that's, that's the key. So people need to continue to speak to each other, I'm afraid. Oh, I think that's a good news. 
Hey, yeah. whenever I have that bin manager hat, that's the most valuable lesson is really just getting into those designer shoes and say, hey, what is your problem? And working to solve that problem rather than let's just teach you how to model walls. Um, I, I found that to be ben very beneficial. And I'm sorry, uh, one of you guys was about to say something. I didn't mean to interrupt. Sahil, Shannon, one of you guys, I think. Oh, oh no! I mean, I, I was just okay. gonna say that um, uh, one one of the uh, biggest advantage we use Slack for our internal communication, and that's been very very useful when when the pandemic happened. Like it's it's been like that's one of those other things that we just can't live without anymore. Yeah, and I was just basically agreeing with uh, what Sean was saying about the you know resource management and, and tools to do that. Um, you know, we have. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we've got groups all over the uh, the country, and you know we we try to collaborate and make sure that we have uh, good management of all the tasks that are going on and all the people that are engaged on each project, and you know what one person is doing versus someone else. So being able to manage a team, uh, you know, across different offices uh, all over is is definitely important. And you're right; it doesn't matter what tool you use. Um, you know, as long as it's something that's going to benefit you and bring you value and allow you to do that a lot more efficiently, that's really the biggest biggest point. And Shannon, there's a question in the chat designated directly to you there. So what tools or practices have you used to communicate model information to the field? Um, I, I mentioned some of them earlier. Uh, we, we utilize uh, Revit quite a bit um, because we self-perform um, uh, concrete on a lot of our projects. So we're a big, big self-perform contractor um, and we typically model within Revit. But uh, in order to communicate with the field, um, you know, SketchUp is a, is a big um, uh, product for us uh, to be able to you know, really sketch up uh, details and we can communicate that back to the design team as well as communicate that to the field. Um, and it's an easy way to, to, to do that. Uh, we also have uh, products like Procore, um, which is our project management system. Uh, so there's more and more features that are getting added to Procore, more integrations with some of our other tools uh, like Navisworks, we're able to, you know, look at a, a, a model, a collaboration model and actually send that to the field so that they can QAQC, some of the things that are getting installed uh, in the field. Um, Revisto has been a new one uh, that we've started to use for collaboration for all stakeholders. So uh, our client, our design partners, um, our, our folks here and uh, within the, the construction or general contracting, our pre-construction groups. Um, so we, 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 don't, uh, we don't hone in on, on one uh, particular application, but we have a variety at our, at our disposal and we kind of just pick and choose and utilize what, what's the best for that specific uh, scenario. Well said, and I think we're gonna come back to coordination and maybe even Revisto in just a second. But I think one item too is, you know, there's a lot of tech out there. There's a lot that you have to do while, you know, maintaining project velocity. So what are some of the common pitfalls or gaps across the building lifecycle with the BIM process and how have you each resolved those? Maybe Francois, we can start with you or um, whoever else to start speaking. Sure, I, I would say that for us as designers, that in, in many cases, the challenge is when we bid and when we pass over the design to the contractor. And we, we still have questions around who owns the model, who owns the data, the, the you know the official requirements and deliverables are 2d drawings exported from the model but can we share the model for information you know the all of those discussions that always come back again and again and i think the industry the aec industry uh the hasn't been able to come up with a kind of a, an agreement on that and that's still very much on a project by project basis and the level of uh, coordination and collaboration you can have between the designers on one, on one hand, the contractors, and then the, the client, the owner, what, what they want to do. So that's really when, when we, you know, the, the ownership changes. So that's design build and then uh, the handover. So what do we do and, uh, you know, as built model from the as built model to the facilities management, you know, who owns what, if there are any issues, who is responsible for what, you know, I think that's, that's really in that workflow that, that the challenge are still very, very present. 
do you define that in your BIM execution plan? Yeah, it should be. I mean, maybe not a hundred percent, but yeah. I mean, that's that's a key question. So when because writing a BIM execution plan is just about managing risks, uh, so it's identifying risk and trying to find solutions, and that's a big risk. Um, so yeah, that's that questions need to be asked at least. Yeah, and, and um, I would also want to add that um, in the BIM execution plan, like for all projects, it's different, but we try to get like a bigger sense. I mean, we I did touch upon this a little bit earlier, but um, in terms of projects, like the data um, that we generate and then the rework that needs to be done, we want to minimize that. And also we want to make sure upfront if, for example, let's say, if the project is going to use Kobe. Um, so we want to make sure that us as designers, we we don't necessarily would populate everything, but we would know that, you know, Kobe is going to be used. So we set up our projects in such a way that it would facilitate this for the next person who will be in charge of the project. So we don't want to have something that, okay, this is our, you know, we, we, we're done with our part now, we're just going to hand off and then you guys can do whatever you want with your models and then, you know, you can deal with it. So we, we want to try to get everyone as um, on board as early as we can, or at least uh, as practically possible. So that uh, the the work is streamlined across all different project um, you know teams, so that we don't uh, unnecessarily waste time, or it's just easier for everyone. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say I'm basically sentiments to, to uh, or uh, agree with with both of you all on uh, just the the common pitfalls. I think are you know the lack of of early planning. Um, you know, starting with starting with the end in mind is, is is what I always say because you know that that's that's what our goal is. That's what our expectation is of that project or the, the uh, number of projects. And uh, like Sahil and um, and Francois said, you know, starting with that that BIM execution plan. And I think that's the that's the most important piece because uh, if we there is some sort of deliverable or requirement that the uh, that the owner wants, uh, we definitely want to be able to. Uh, provide that and do that as smoothly as possible through um, the entire project, starting with the design through construction and then delivering that uh, uh, that end deliverable. So I would say the the common pitfall was probably lack of really planning, and, and we've seen the, the the difference from a project that is planned early, has set it up correctly, and you know we've been successful, and then the projects that have not done it so well, and you know we. Uh, you know issues so we, we we've learned from those mistakes and we, we understand that early planning is, is the way to go yeah I mean yeah. I think I've hit all of the main main, main points here and, and I don't think there's any disagreement and, and just to, to emphasize the data point is just just remembering it in these that, that to, to track down what information is important to who and when and having that all laid out because again back to the information that's what we're gonna pass so even if the platform changes as long as the information is correct then then we at least have a baseline to work from Right, and a lot of the times those BIM execution plans are living, breathing documents even throughout the project. Um, when you get into not necessarily new construction, but when you get into renovations, that recognition of scope and what exactly you have to model is, you know, changes from project to project. And it also changes based on, cli on client to client. So as that changes, you have to be able to be, and I like to use the term multiple, to be able to change pretty quickly um sometimes that helps but sometimes it you know you have to go back and backtrack and everything else because things constantly change i mean while you know pretty much the technology is not staying the same but it's so exponentially vast that the critical variable is is the human you know we can have all this stuff there but it's the decision of a human being to say what they want when they want it and then have to change their mind which is you know which definitely affects you know projects absolutely and Damien I got a quick question from our audience as a follow-up on that do you use any specific tools for your BIM execution plan to try to keep your team on track to meet the targets or the fluid changes that are occurring it, uh... on a QAQC level there's some there's some stuff we do internally um but again you have similar client you know when you're talking on a higher level you have similar clients you they you know you have a general expectation of what they want but things can change based on you know project ex exclusivity or 
or anything else. It's really hard to monitor. I think the main thing you got to fall back on what your main goal is as a company and what your team's expectations are first and then be able to change them as you know as needed but you need the standard first and then whether it's every six months or every year to revisit those um is what you really have to fo you know focus on absolutely got that i think coordination is is definitely a, a big thing and we're not probably just talking about coordination as it relates to to models and items clashing with one another but really coordinating as a team to figure out exactly who needs what when they need it and really just keep track of all of those items so i'd like to introduce another poll here and this is really probably going to be specific to perhaps coordinating between the field and the office so with this poll it's when it comes to coordination efforts, what tools are you using? Um, does VR, AR have a place in your workflow? If so, why? And that's what we'll be getting into as a discussion next. Hi, Karen. So we've got the results through. 22% um, uh, said Bluebeam markups, 20% said Revit coordination review, 28% said Navisworks, and 30% said other coordination software. Wow, we really have a full spectrum across um, everybody. So that's pretty impressive to see. What are your thoughts, um, panelists? So what are you guys using for your coordination efforts? I, w I was going to say, is there a, 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 a selection for all of the above? <laughs> I think we, you know, de depending on the project, we, we use um, pretty much all of those and sometimes, you know, one or two of those at, at, at a time, um, you know, just to make sure that we cover every stakeholder, everyone has access to the information. You know, Bluebeam may be the simplest way and just creating the studio and being able to mark up and have you know, different teams mark mark up in the same uh, document, but it may be easier to look at a model um, and, you know, visualize what that building element should look like and how we need to coordinate it before uh, installing it. So, uh, you know, for us, it's it's a it's a combination of, of all of those tools and, and even more uh, of how we, you know, kind of coordinate depending on who the stakeholder is and who the, uh, the user is and who needs to actually experience that data and get access to it. Yeah, I think the 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 key thing there is is, is, is as he as he says, Jen said, um, what 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 are you coordinating? So you know, is it, <laughs> is it the model? Is it is it a document? I mean, you're not going to coordinate a document. You're going to use Word and you're going to use markups and stuff like that. Um, I do think that that you know VR has been making making strides and in, in this latest generation where a headset is 300 bucks and completely mobile. Did my audio die, guys? No, I, I think, I think we, he's uh, I think we, it's okay. lost. It cut off okay. weird. Sorry, I'm I can jump in on, on VR yeah. too, uh, <laughs> just kind of talk about that. But uh, you know, we we utilize VR quite a bit, uh, especially in our early phases of the project when you know we need you know uh, user groups to experience the space before we uh, even finish design. Um, you know, a lot of times that's where it it, it helps is during design development. Uh, so that we can uh, show, you know, for example, healthcare, um, you know, nurses and doctors what their exam room or their surgery room is going to look like, uh, so they can optimize it for their best workflow. And you know, that's where we've seen the the biggest bang for the buck in in utilizing VR is in those scenarios when we can help the owner make, uh, you know, decisions a lot earlier when the cost of those decisions are, are very small. Uh, and I think that's where VR has been really successful for us in implementing it. 
have you seen a significant increase on it, Shannon, since the pandemic? Uh, I think so. With, with a lot of the, the virtual tools, um, you know, there's there's a lot of products out there that allow you to, you know, if, if each person has a, a virtual headset, they can all be in the same environment at the same time. Um, so, you know, with the, you know, with the pandemic and us working remotely, you know, there's there's more of a need to, to do that because typically we would go in person to the office or to the job site or to the uh, design firm's office and meet with the clients and then do the VR session. But because we can't do that now, uh, you know, these tools have allowed us to do that remotely and still be in that same immersive environment and get the same value for it. Welcome back, Sean. I think we lost <laughs> you before. <laughs> Not all of the challenges of, of remote have been to, fixed yet. Yes, we're still limited to our internet bandwidth, um, that's for sure. So did, do you have a place for VR, AR in your workflows? Um, you know, we, we talk about pen and paper all the time, and now, of course, we have PDFs. But I've been seeing a bit of a shift, and Shannon was mentioned in one as well. Uh, yeah, um, I'm not sure how much of what I got out before I got cut off, probably all of it. But uh, yeah, with the... With the um, Headset, uh, mobile headsets now being 300 bucks, uh, it's it's feasible to 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 give your whole team VR. Um, it, you know, a couple button presses out of rivet, you get a model, and designers can look at the model in ways that they weren't looking at it before. Uh, I, I know I'm I'm sure all of us have, have tried VR at some point in our offices and, and gotten that designer who was eh, about it into it, who all of a sudden went, holy crap! Like I can see the building. I can like, you know, we design from the God's view, but people got to live in it person view. So, you know, being able to see that early on is, is a powerful tool. Yeah, yeah we, we have some examples where we use augmented reality, so AR in Arcadis in the US. I think we have ad adopted a bit more AR than, than VR. And we have, you know, projects where we, we model the existing situation of an existing asset that we have to refurbish, and we can have someone on the site wearing uh, an AR uh, headset, like you know the Holo Hololens, uh, on the on the hard hat, and we can have. I mean, the technician can have a Skype call with someone in the office and share what he or she sees in the job site directly. And we have had examples where we have Revit technicians who were missing some information about the site, just having a, a Skype call via AR, and they were able to see what the technician was seeing on the site uh, via the screen. And so that was really very effective because sometimes you just miss you know, the size of a pump or a valve and, and the job site is maybe 200 miles away. You will not go there just for that. So having being able to share that kind of uh, information and leveraging Skype and the communication technology is really, really beneficial in terms of health and safety, in terms of, uh, you know, even uh, sustainability impact. So, yeah, we have we have used that a bit. Yeah, for, for us, um, I mean, I'm going to, I come from a different perspective on this. Like, I'll talk about an earlier phase of this. Um, we use we use VR to actually inform our design to better design, um, because now we uh, we certainly have a very different view of looking at the building, and it's now, like Sean mentioned, it's very accessible by everyone, um, and we're using VR to, you know, just to make sure that we have we, we make better design decisions early on in the phase so that you know it benefits everyone the clients and then and then the other part of this vr is like a lot of our clients like to see their buildings in vr um so that that's also something that we <laughs> were able to do at this moment like we can walk them through it like in real so they they're also like very excited about these kinds of new technology that we're you know using at the moment um <clears throat> and then the other part of this whole vr um side would come in let's say um coordination like you would be able to view your clashes in in 3D space and VR space and then you can quickly take a call on you know how to best resolve something you know versus having you know seeing them in on your screen in computer so i mean we we wouldn't uh get a lot into the VR into the um clash coordination at this moment but that's something we're also looking into but especially the early phase in terms of client designs and client presentations and in terms of designers using VR, 
um, yeah, it, it's been it's been a very exciting thing for us. That's very awesome to hear from everyone. So it, it definitely does have its place. And I kind of got to agree with Francois. I am personally have a preference towards the AR. I just like seeing something on an iPad or a little bit more, I guess you could say, computer wise to be able to walk through it rather than putting on those goggles. I think I put on those headsets and I, I just still get sick personally. And I think a lot of the older staff could even simplify, sympathize with me on that too. I mean, I think a part of it too, it really always depends upon your current content and your current processes. I mean, Unify does have a place in managing any and all content. So when you're getting into, hey, let's let's really start working with this and putting in the piece of content that we really need, that level of development, maybe rather than that level of detail, becomes super important and really want to be able to kind of find it all. Um, so I know we're coming up towards the end of the presentation. So I have one last kind of question from the panel here, and then we can get into some Q&A from our audience. Audience. Well, some additional q and I've been kind of knocking out questions as we go. So I, I know it's probably more difficult than ever to predict considering the velocity we're moving into the future, but what changes are, can we possibly expect within the next five to 10 years? Maybe what are the most critical changes specifically that we must make to really optimize the collaboration amongst our different teams? I think um, one thing is the adoption of the model as a project deliverable. I don't think we're there yet, um, but I think it's coming and it's coming fast. And, you know, off of that is, you know, since we're all collaborating on our own model specifically, architecture, structure, MEP, et cetera, maybe in 10 years you see everybody working in the same model where you maybe go away from the architectural set and the structural set and the MEP and then you almost have a design intent as built. That's why I see it. It's just, again, everybody now kind of has spread out using their own technology and their own features and their own reasonings for developing um, their documentation. And then trying to circle that back around, you know, will be something, you know, really, you know, really, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a word really well make it simple really difficult to you know to corral everybody but maybe that you know maybe that adaptation might be beneficial in the future i think we see i mean as we're seeing and, and we're forced to see now that the cloud trend will continue and and, and will accelerate and uh expanding on that that idea you know it, Maybe more idealistic, but uh, if it is about the information, maybe it's not the model we're sharing. Maybe it's the information. The information is building the model. So maybe we don't all need to be in the same platform. Maybe we don't all need to be in the same tool. We just need access to that information to construct, you know, our interpretation of that data and in, in, in how we need to work. I like that idea because Shannon, you're using just what four platforms alone for your collaboration effort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we yeah, we don't play favorites uh, at all. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say uh, you know, and you know, to try to predict the future obviously is is, is difficult. But um, I think something Damien mentioned earlier about the the human element is something really to be said about the use of technology and something that we've seen uh, you know over the last year or so that you know this technology that we knew we had uh, we we know the the value of it and uh, being able to realize the value through the entire life cycle of the project, I think is something that will hopefully become a standard uh, moving forward and not just, um, you know, something that we can add on, you know, uh, uh, you know, as, as needed, but just uh, a way for us to design and build um, these facilities moving, moving forward. But I also see, uh, like Sean mentioned, a lot of the data uh, that we collect uh, because a lot of these, softwares and platforms are, allow us to, you know, either collect data or add data to it. I think a lot of that data is going to be used downstream for, you know, predictive an, uh, analytics for, you know, how how is this type of building going to perform over, you know, the next 30, 40, 50 years? Because, you know, we've built, you know, 100 of these uh, over, you know, over the past 10 years. You know, we can start to predict things about, you know, buildings based on that data, too and then utilize that for uh, to, to build better buildings in the future. 
Go ahead, Sai. Yeah, I, I was gonna say like to Sean's point and to Shannon's point, like data data management, like data science skills in general, like um, is going to become more and more important because <clears throat> what we're essentially doing is building a database um, with our models and the ability to manage that database effectively so that you know um, every party that's involved in the project um, lifecycle is something that you know is going to be key um we, i mean even even in terms of a vendor neutral or um, ifc data or something like not something that's specific to you know locked into a certain ecosystem but um just open source new vendor uh, neutral um, data sources and databases that um you know everyone can access and it's easily modifiable and can be transferred downstream as needed um but another thing that I, um, I mean, this is something that we've been um, looking at as well, like is the concept of digital twins becoming more and more um, common in the future. I mean, it's more to do with facilities management in that sense, but it's also something that, you know, if you have a digital twin of your uh, model as an as-built element, you have the complete database of every single moving part in your building. Um, and this, all this data could be then, you know, like, and then this would, um, you know, you, you can look at it in terms of even machine learning, like you feed all this data and then you, you can use machine learning to actually improve the processes um, and the design moving forward. Yeah, I was about to add about yeah that machine learning artificial intelligence concept where you see the big trends are around automation, computational design, generative design. So that's really where the the, the industry is going. How far how far are we from you know project that will be fully automated and designed by a computer that I don't know. But to get there, we need data, and I think those beam models we are creating that's just the foundation of that. So, so currently we are building a structured foundation because with Revit or any other BIM software, we use a, we create a structured database, which is super important. That's the very first step. So we are just you know building the the launching pad, and then there will be a rocket going to whatever planet. But we are just at the <laughs> launching pad for now with the, those BIM models for me. And yeah, hard to tell what the future better. will look like. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to borrow that for um, future uh, discussions there. So I'm going to go ahead and reshare my screen if I can manage to share the right one. I'm not positive at the moment. Sorry, I'm a little unfamiliar with this. Do you guys see my Word doc or my PowerPoint? <laughs> PowerPoint. You Q and okay. A. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> That's what I was hoping for. All right, guys. So I know we've gone just a couple minutes over and we had some great questions from the audience, but I think we can maybe only pick one just to round out the rest of today's discussion. And I think, you know, between talking us about, you know, what the future has in store, like our latest topic, whether we're talking about pitfalls or gaps or really revamping them process, I think it all comes down to the people, which is really where we started. So if you guys could give it in, you know, 10 seconds or less, or let's let's go 30 seconds or less with, with, with each of you, what coaching or training do you think is really necessary, both to promote the additional tool sets we're using, or whether we're talking about getting the necessary feedback that we need to continue to adapt our current processes? Oh, no. Happy to jump here. Uh, so yeah, beam implementation is change management and change management is about putting people outside of their comfort zone. So we need to make sure, we need to show them we are here to support them. They will have a lot of questions, a lot of workflow will change. And I think yeah, the soft skills and being able to be here and be a people oriented person and, 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 and speak with the others is really important. I would say that my job is 80% of just people's management and 20% is around technology. And then I know experts in technology that I can rely on because I'm not that guy. So yeah, that's really digital transformation is about people management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's having to be there, you know, anytime. I mean, we all know that the AEC industry is not a nine to five job. Um, and being able to be accessible for all those times for all those people, no matter what, you know, what they are. I mean, Personally, I always see our team and our company as my client, so I have to support them any which way. 
um, besides having, you know, the design team or the owner as clients as well, um, getting them up to up to snuff with training and everything else, you know, leading them in the right directions, um, and then being able to figure out their skill sets and seeing, you know, how we can leverage their skills and integrate them to make, you know, make them excel and then make their projects a lot easier to handle is is very critical. Yeah, I mean, I, I also agree with you guys. Like one of the challenges that we've, uh, I particularly like face usually is like with, <clears throat> in terms of people, like everyone has their different strengths and weaknesses and then how we train them or how we teach them in terms of how they'll best grasp it or how, how best they'll be able to understand everything is key in terms of like what we want to do is just empower them like okay you be be that be their um coach so that they can do go out there and do things that they need to do without you know any hindrance along the way yeah i think that that uh, i agree with, with you know, that people learn in different ways and it's really hard because you have to be able to provide the content in the way that anyone can understand not just one type of learner so you you, you know it, it, it's it's hard work and you have to you have to help them and give them all of the resources you can to to, to help them learn yeah you know te technology is not a one-size-fits-all you know uh, we, we always say that there's no uh no magic you know easy button uh, when it comes to, you know, implementing technology or, you know, thinking that one program is going to solve all your problems. So, um, you know, I, I think all of you have kind of kind of mentioned that and, you know, just understanding the, the needs of each individual project and each individual person um, is, is going to be, you know, what's going to make us successful in this implementation of, of technology because everybody has a different need. Uh, everybody has a different, like Sean said, a way of learning. Uh, so being able to adapt to all of those different things and changing environment um, is definitely going to be, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the way we handle this uh, moving forward. Yeah, even to jump back to, on there, Shannon, even even though I've gotten many requests on having an easy button. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yep, I have to. I, th I think we even, even found one of those, uh, those toy ones. We can, somebody comes in the office, you just press the button and say, yep, it's done. <laughs> That's as easy as I think it's ever going to get. <laughs> right, exactly. Was there somebody else with a last thought, Damien? I think that was you, maybe, or no? No, I'm good. Okay, fantastic. All right, all. Well, I want to thank you all so much. You know, speaking a lot to what everyone was saying about you, you have to be able to present the information very simply um, and very, you know, really adapting yourself to that specific user. That's exactly really how I work with all of our customers here at Unify. You know, everyone's got content management issues, but everyone utilizes Unify in slightly different ways. And that's really where I excel, is just really listening to all of those issues and addressing them case by case. Um, sometimes saying the same thing in just different ways. That's all that needs to be done. So once again, I'd like to thank our panelists, especially, as well as, of course, the organizers over there at our digital construction. So, thank you all. Thank, thank you, you so thank you. much, um, Karen you, and all of our thank panelists, bye -bye. Um, as well as our sponsor of the session, Unify Labs, um, and everyone who's joined us in the audience today. All sessions are AIA approved, and you'll receive a certificate of attendance within one week of today's webinar. Our next session of the series will take place at 1 p.m. today, Eastern Time, and it's a panel discussion looking at reality capture and analysis value today and possibilities of tomorrow. So thank you once again to our full panel and to Karen, uh, our moderator, as well as the session sponsor Unify Labs. And uh, we hope to see you again uh, online soon. Thanks all, stay safe.